Brian, man. Charles. It's been way too long. Way too long. So I'm that glad was... you're still here and not retired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much too mean and stubborn and uh, <laughs> other... Uh, just take your favorite negative uh, uh, attribute and apply it to me, and that's on 2x to retire. <laughs> okay. So we can't really talk about what you're working on right now because it's still being baked, but we can yes. talk about what's really interesting. Uh, that's on the mind of all developers right yes. now because of many cores, concurrency. Yes. And I know you have some very interesting ideas around programming and concurrency. Can we talk about the problem space and what sure. you're going to talk about today? Yes, a uh, a serious problem in concurrent processing. By the way, I've been working in concurrent processing for a long time. First thing I did in a, in the area was the time warp operating system with David Jefferson and uh, yep. and a cast of uh, ultimately thousands. <laughs> but um, uh, Peter Ryer, Phil Hontalis, Mike DiLoretto, Kathy Sturdivant, just to go over the list of. Uh, Oh, big Fred brains. Wheeland. Yeah, big brains. And, and uh, we created a whole operating system in which programs uh, could go forward and backward in time. And the purpose was to synchronize them. The, uh, the, the only synchronization primitive was rollback. If some process received a message out of order in time, that's a little bit like receiving an address reference that's out of core and causes a page fault. Well, we call it a time fault. Okay. And we could run big distributed simulations on multiple computers and uh, get speed ups of large. So, for example, on 84 butterfly processors, we got speed up of 60. That means a simulation that took an hour to run only took a minute to run. Nice. These kind of ideas from Time Warp have uh, survived in, uh, in uh, multiple forms. One of them is uh, recently read a, a thesis on collision detection where uh, one of the biggest problems in games programming is collision detection and, and uh, managing collisions. You know, what do you do when, how do you detect a collision? You know, because you have little tiny floating point errors and something may penetrate just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But that's not okay, because if it penetrates a little bit, it's not long before it falls through the floor. Okay. <laughs> and so, how do you detect collisions and how do you respond to them? And uh, one application of time warp is to pursue multiple parallel scenarios all at once and have interacting objects communicate with each other via messages and when a mistake is made roll each other back and and restart the computation and cancel bad effects and so on Excellent. so actually inside each frame calculation there's a little time warp calculation that figures out whether collisions are happening and how to respond to them hmm. and other applications are in database programming where rollback is a way of life and if you're streaming data in you receive uh, you receive some update notice that's out of order you need to roll back to a good state and restore it and time warp ideas work very well in there but the whole point of this of time warp mm -hmm. was we worked on non-shared memory machines it was a network of computers and the only memory that a, that a, a process had was just whatever it had okay does this was uh, I'll mention the M word again this was the ambient monad for a process. This was the, the ambient monad. The ambient monad for each <laughs> process. So each little process had an instance of the monad type in which it could safely do updates, but it only interacted with other processes via messages, okay. which were like function calls. The only difference between messages and function calls is that function calls, in a function call, you mention the address of the function and the arguments. In time warp, you had to mention the address of the function the time at which you wish to make the call, the virtual time, the simulation time, and then the arguments. So every function call had two coordinates, time and space. It's a little too weird for gen generic programming, but for simulation and database it works out really well. Sure. But the, the idea is no shared memory, period. The only way to get data from one thing to another was via messages. Okay. So I want to show in a sequential programming environment a similar kind of thing where there's no shared memory. Shared memory is what causes problems in distributed and concurrent processing because now you have to coordinate the sharing. Okay. You have to lock, you know, you get the uh, one writer, many readers problem. You have to locks, which can be expensive. Somebody who wants to update some memory has to protect it from people who might be reading it at the wrong time. You may not know how long to protect it in real time. Mm -hmm. you know, nasty. So let me ask a question. Yeah, then. sure. Don't let me ramble on. No, you're, <laughs> you're rambling on is, is priceless. So um, there's two things, though. For example, 
running on an operating uh, on hardware that runs an operating system like Windows. Yeah. Shared memory is everywhere. Sure. And the operating system takes care of dealing with the lowest level certain types of, you know, spin lock. Absolutely. Uh, and dealing with conflicts. Yeah. Interlock compare exchange, mutexes, semaphores, mailboxes, the whole schmear. You got it. Now you're saying up at the programming language, uh, you're going to be able to to supersede. So I guess what I'm really trying to ask is. You're going, to, you're going to show us through monads and other things how you can write programming uh, programs without shared memory. Yes. I get that, passing functions around. Yes. But the underlying system upon which this is running on is shared memory. Yes. So that's all I was trying to get at. I see. Well, yeah, it works well as long as you can control the performance of it. Mm. Uh, if you have big distributed systems and you take a lock on something that's shared across the network, mm -hmm. you don't know how long. How long? A minute, yeah. five a day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we've had some, uh, we've had some, uh, some outages that were days long uh, on on the internet. Okay. So, um, sure, the techniques of controlling, uh, controlling shared memory, the the logical techniques through the this various zoo of things like semaphores and mutexes and, and yeah. the name pipes and one. Yeah. It's, it's it's all well understood and been around for for as long as uh, functional ideas. Okay. But if you don't have to use it, why would you use it? Agreed. It adds complexity, and it adds in the in uh, in uh, distributed setting, it adds uncontrollable performance liens on your program. You don't know how long things are going to take. Um, the complexity alone, though, is one reason. I'm not I'm not trying to promote one way of programming over another. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say there is another way to program without these things. Okay. And that is programming with pure mathematical functions. And the definition of a pure mathematical function is the following. Every time you call it with the same arguments, you get back exactly the same answer. Understood. It's like sine of x. If you call sine of 1.1, every single time you call sine of 1.1, you get back exactly the same answer. That's a mathematical function. Is it possible to program absolutely anything using just mathematical functions? Yes. You don't actually if you're a mathematician or well, a physicist, like right? You. <laughs> it takes a little practice and a little, uh, 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 I don't know, a little practice and experience to get used to the style. Mm -hmm. But there are benefits to it. Uh, you don't really have to worry about uh, uh, shared memory at all, because every time you see a function, you pass the same arguments, you get the same answer. There's no updating going on. Once you've created something, once you've created a value or created a function, function becomes essentially a table lookup then. Okay. There's logically no difference between a function that does a computation and a function that does a table lookup if nothing can ever change. Mm -hmm. Sine of 1.1 is always sine of 1.1. You might as well store the, the uh, value of the input and the value of the output in a table. Okay. In fact, uh, you can institutionalize this. You can make functions that do a computation exactly once and then store the answer in a table. Mm -hmm. And every, anybody who's created a math library knows this trick. You convert functions into functions that do computations into functions that do table lookups. In pure mathematics, the table that you have might be infinitely long, and the distance between there might be uh, no distance at all. You know, you, the domain might be the real numbers, in which case even the domain is uncountably infinite. So you can't realize this as a table lookup. But logically, mm -hmm. it's exactly a table lookup. You give me a number, I give you back a number. Let's lift that up one, one level. You give me a value, I give you back a value. Mm -hmm. So how can we do stateful programming with some idea like this? Absolutely. Let me uh, show you a couple of ways. I actually have prepared here a few ways of doing stateful programming uh, uh, in a kind of standard example, which is labeling a tree. Okay. You give me a tree, and I promise to put labels on the, on the leaves of the tree. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Somebody has to remember what the current value of the label is so that when you get to some other place in the tree, you can update that uh, uh, value. So we'll call that the state. Okay. Now, one way to do this, let me show uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have this all coded up in a That's nice awesome. little. By the way, this little C sharp program I'll give you at the end. And, um, you will. I'll give you this at the end, and you can share it out. And, Perfect. Uh, and I have a Haskell version here and a C sharp here. We will put it with the post of this video. Super. And then I have a bunch of pictures, which actually, some people find these pictures helpful, and some people don't. So I kind yeah. of want to uh, 
uh, pictures are good. I want to show this demonstration in all these three ways. So the, okay. the, this is not a carefully written program. The purpose of this program is just to demonstrate these ideas. Um, so I have a public class program. Everything's public because I didn't have any reason not to make it public. Let's look at a data type for a tree, and I'll show. I'll show. I'll go back and forth between the Haskell on the left and the Has and the uh, C sharp on the right. Over here in Haskell, you can say that uh, a tree is either this bar means either a leaf or a branch. So this is a binary tree, a very simple encoding of a type for a binary tree. Okay. This little A here means anything. So a tree of strings is either a leaf of a string, that's certainly a tree, a leaf is a tree, or a branch containing two trees of string. So here's an example of such a tree. I have a, at the top level I have a branch, on the left I have a leaf of A, and on the right I have another branch, and then that goes to a branch with a leaf of B, and a leaf of A, and then the the branch that I left over at the top has a D. So it looks like A, uh, B, A, D, I think. Okay. All right, so a really simple one. And I'm, I, what I'm promising to do is insert numbers on there. So this will be A0, this will be B1, this will be A2, and this will be D3 or something like that. And let me execute the C program just to see what the C sharp program, just to see what it comes up with. Oops. Control Z. Uh, this is what I want. Okay, so here I've here's the unlabeled tree A B C D I C in the Haskell program. I called it. Uh, I had an A there. I should have had a C there. Uh, I said it wasn't carefully written. Um, here's a uh, in the C sharp code. Uh, I labeled the tree by hand zero one two three. I labeled the tree non monadically, and so I'll show you how to do that statelessly, but not using a monad. Okay. So now statelessly, statelessly, not using a monad. statelessly without the monad means you're just passing the state around in a function argument. Every function grows another argument that is the current value of this counter. Okay. So you bump it and pass it down to the next guy. And I'll show you exactly how that works. Monad is just a way of abstracting that pattern of passing the state variable around and making it compositional. So remember in Don't Fear the Monads, the whole message was... Yeah. The monadic bind is just function composition in disguise, thin disguise. Okay. So the whole point of the whole point of passing things around in function arguments is to avoid an implicit state. It's still state. It's just passed around explicitly in function arguments. The problem in distributed concurrent programming is if you have an implicit state, some place where you're updating variables. And now if you have two processes updating the same variables, they don't know when a variable has such and such a value. Mm -hmm. If you're changing the meaning of sine of 1.1, well, which answer are you going to get back? You're going to get back today's answer or tomorrow's answer? You don't know. You've got to coordinate. So you have to have some other mechanism for coordinating. Understood. And it's implicit. It's hidden from the program. This stuff is all in the program text itself. So you just by looking at the program, you can tell what's going on. State's being threaded around through function arguments. Wow. We're safe. Yeah. The coordination of, of updating and passing the state is explicit. Everybody knows what's going on. It just the downside of it is that every function gets its state argument, and you can get rid of that by going to a monad. And it's a little sleight of hand. Mm -hmm. It's actually very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And general, because it's just one kind of monad. There's a list monad, there's a maybe monad, there's a continuation monad. Mm -hmm. All these things have the same kind of compositional patterns, all about being able to compose these things that do these sophisticated operations like passing state around. Okay. Okay, so here's we can see that I get the same results from the non-monadically labeled tree. That's where I'm explicitly passing the state around, still stateless. And here's the monadically labeled tree, same result. The leaf that has an A gets a zero, then I got a branch, then I got a branch, then I got a leaf on the left with a B and a C, and then I got a leaf on the right of this branch. Anyway, it's easier to look at than to talk about. So that just shows that the C sharp code works. Let's look at the non-monadically labeled one first. Okay. In C sharp, I actually am going to make classes that that have um, 
a generic type argument, little a. This is kind of unusual for C sharp, but I'm trying to make it look a little bit like the Haskell. So over here on the, um, oops, leaf a, you know, this line of Haskell, data tra equals leaf a or br, tra, tra, this actually constr creates constructor functions. The leaf of a is now, it's behind the scenes creates a constructor function. So in C sharp, I have to have a type um, that has that constructor function. Let's see, how am I doing this here? Uh, I'll just let you, uh, oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. I don't actually put it in the constructor, but you load the contents with a, with a property. And same thing with this branch. Probably a cleaner way of doing this would be to make a constructor that loads the contents in that way. Good. It's, it's immutable. Once you create the thing, you set the uh, values in it, you never ever change them. That's okay. what makes it, uh, that's what makes it uh, like a mathematical function. Now what happens, one of the, I, I like to ask Eric this too, because yeah. like Eric, he's also you know a high priest of the Lambda Calculus. <laughs> um, what happens when an exception is thrown? Ah. What happens to your nice little model yes. of memory? Well, if I do this in the right way, then I model exceptions with the continuation monad, and it's just another monadic computation. Okay. That would probably quintuple the size of this, and you'd have to go away for a month <laughs> if I found a spare time to do it. Understood. But, but in Haskell, it's kind of built in, and um, uh, the continuation monad uh, is universal in the sense that um, there's, there's a nice paper that proves that exceptions and coroutines and bounded coroutines and all the usual uh, concurrency structures like mutexes and semaphores and so on are, mod are modeled as uh, in the continuation monad. So continuation monad is all you need. You, you thread it through the other things. The, the, the monadic uh, tree labeler here is actually going to have two monads at work. Okay. You'd thread this through the continuation monad, and then you'd safely handle exceptions. So one thing I'd like to do, because you know, showing, filming the screen uh, with my camera, I still do old school style Channel Nine interviews. I don't yeah. actually expect you to install Camtasia. Oh, and then okay, I'm gonna good. Then yes. edit it back for it. But that is something that we could do over time. There's people uh, who produce content for Channel Nine that are making videos like that yes. that are really nice to watch. Oh, okay, good. Yes, you could see. You in a little box talking, yeah, and then the full screen and great resolution would be that your screen. Oh, okay, yeah. so that's something that we should do at some point, but we're not Good. doing that today. All right, because this is mainly coming and talking to you, and I yes. want you to be off the cuff, and I want you to be well prepared. Yes, but I do want to take a look at the picture Good. that you have underneath there that I can yeah. get a clean shot yeah. of. All right, and let have me... you explain what we're looking at. All right, let me then let me jump let me jump straight to. Page two, well, page three. Okay. This is the, this is a very direct transcription of the equivalent of, of two programs, the Haskell one and the C sharp one. Okay. And this is the non monadic tree labeling function. At the top level is a function named label, and it takes a tree of any type and returns a labeled tree of any type where the label tree is a tree of state and content pairs, where the state and the label are the same thing. Okay. I just write the state as S here because it could be anything. It doesn't have to be a number. You could put anything you want in there. This, exactly the same program will work no matter what the type of S is. But for, now, for the purpose of this, we just put a number in there. So here's what label does. It takes in a tree and it spits out a label tree, just as promised. What does it do inside? Well, inside there's a it calls another function named lab. And the type of this internal function named lab is something that takes a tree and a state and returns a pair of a state and a labeled tree. So there's two levels of pairing going on. Remember that a labeled tree is a tree of a state and a contents. And what lab does is take in a non-labeled tree, a value of the state and it returns a pair of the state and a label tree. Now let's look at how, how label, the top level function, calls lab. It just takes the tree that was passed into label and sends it into lab, and then it sends zero in as the state. That's the first label that we want. Hmm. So you notice that zero doesn't come in from the outside, it's just poof, out of thin air inside label. 
Okay. You just write it as a literal zero, pass it in, no big deal. Lab puts out a, remember, lab puts out a state and a label tree pair, so I put that as two out arrows, the state on the bottom and the label tree on the top. And then I have this library function named SND or second, and all that does is throw away the second of the of its two inputs. Or sorry, the throw away the first of its two inputs and keeps the second. So it takes the label tree, it throws whatever this lab does a whole bunch of stuff inside, which I'll show you in a second. And it spits out the state and the label tree, and SND keeps just the labeled tree. So yeah, big deal, right? You, mm. Picture almost reads itself. Sure. So what does lab do inside? Well, there are only two cases that lab has to handle. Either the incoming tree is a leaf, or the incoming tree is a branch with a left and a right. Okay. So let's talk about the leaf case first. Remember the signature of lab is it takes a tree and a state, and it returns a state and a labeled tree. It returns both so that we can recursively call, so that lab can recursively call itself. But in the case of a leaf, all it does is this. It takes the whatever's in the tree, X, and strips it out. X is of type A. It takes a number, which is of type S, and it duplicates it. So these, why did I put little, little <laughs> dotted boxes here? I put little dotted boxes here because in the Haskell version of this program, these operations are implicit. If you have, if if you assign a variable, assign, totally wrong word, if you define a variable, in this case n, you'll look over here in the, in the Haskell program, I think I, uh, where's lab, here's lab, I, I uh, define a variable n, then when you refer to n, you don't, you don't actually have to duplicate it, you can refer to n in two places. Okay. But when you draw a picture, you have to actually show that this value got duplicated. So it's a little dotted box. Leaf inverse this is, leaf inverse is the guy who takes a leaf of x and strips away the leaf part and leaves just the x. Well, that's also done implicitly in the Haskell program by um, pattern matching. So over here in the Haskell program, I say that lab of leaf contents, well, that automatically strips off contents, strips the leaf off and leaves me with the contents. So I don't have to draw a nice dark square, uh, dark uh, line box, that's a dotted box. Okay, but look, the picture almost reads itself. It strips off the leaf part, leaves the value, and sends it to this thing that makes a pair. It takes the n and sends that to the thing that makes a pair, and sticks that to leaf. And remember that a leaf of a state and a contents is a labeled tree. All right, remember that? Labeled tree is a tree of a, of, a, mm -hmm. of a state and a contents, and one of the kinds of tree is a leaf, so every leaf is a tree. So this little guy has the right type. You spit that out the top. And then you take the state variable and bump it one, because once you've labeled a, tree, a leaf, you want to bump the state uh, by one and send that's it on right. to the next guy. Got it. So that's all what, that's what lab does on a leaf. What does lab do on a branch? It's, there's a left and a right. So branch inverse gives me the left and right as outputs. Sends one, sends the right one to a recursive call of left. Uh, sorry, a recursive call of lab. Sends the right one a recursive call of lab saves the value as r prime, which has the right type of leaf of tree, takes the left one and sends it to another recursive call of lab with, oh, by the way, whatever the input state value was. And now I couldn't figure out how to draw this without lines crossing, but it sends that value of the state into the right one. So we're going to label the left side of the tree first, and then label the right side of the tree. But notice there's no timing here. All the dependence is just by function, just by passing function values. We don't have to say, do this first, then do that. We just have to say, call this function with that value. Mm -hmm. And the scheduler underneath figures out what to do ahead of what. And it can delay things. It can put them on any processor. It doesn't matter. Sure. Mathematical functions give them the same arguments. They give you the same outputs. This is easy to, you know, you could put one instance of lab. Makes it easier for the engine, the runtime execution. Right. The, the runtime guy can put one instance of lab, one copy of lab on one processor, another copy of lab on another processor, queue up the input arguments, run them through a little machine, take, take out the output values and send them wherever it wants to, mm -hmm. and doesn't have to worry, you know, the implementation has to worry about locks and semaphores and whatnot, but the program author doesn't have to worry about it. The program author is just coding mathematical functions. Okay, we take the left output value and the right output 
L prime and R prime, send them to a new call of BR, which is a constructor, and then that has the right type. Pretty simple, huh? Mm -hmm. So no matter what kind of tree you send it, it figures out that there's a, if it's a leaf, it calls it this way. If it's a branch, it calls it that way. In the C-sharp realization of this code, um, I actually do a, uh, I think I do a dispatch on type by calling is. Let's see, i remind myself how I do this. Um, that sounds like that would Yeah, work. if T is branch. Absolutely. If T is leaf, do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Real easy to read. Just direct trans one to one Haskell program, C sharp program, pictures. Okay, what's this monad stuff? Now let's take a digress, take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask you to memorize something. Okay. Me? Yeah. All right. And and, and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> All you have to memorize is this. An instance of the monad is a function from a state to a state and contents pair. Let's say it again. It's a function from a state to a state contents pair. It sounds weird to do it this way. Where are the contents coming from? You know, we take a state in and we put a state out. That's easy to understand. Where's the contents coming from? Mm -hmm. I'll show you. And there's a really good reason to do it this way and not the other way. It might seem more reasonable to say that an instance of the state monad would be a function from the contents to a content state pair. And in fact, it has exactly the same form as the one I told you but it's not the most convenient for composition. Mm. So remember, state a function from a state to a state contents pair, that is an instance of the monad. So here's a picture. Now I've changed my notation just a little bit. I write the types in both C-sharp and in Haskell. So this little guy is a function that takes a state and returns a state and a contents. At that is an instance of the, or a member, or an element of the state monad. The type of it in C sharp is a function from a state to a state contents pair, and in Haskell it's a function from a state to a state contents pair. Okay, we got it. We got it. We got it right already. Over here is a guy. This is a critter that takes a contents and returns an instance of the state monad. So its type signature is a little funky looking. It's a function from an A to a function of a state to a state contents pair. And here's what it looks like in Haskell, same thing. And it's a kind of a different arrow here because what this critter does, this is a monad maker, what this critter does is make a function. Hmm. Now we can see where A comes from. A came into this monad maker and got threaded through as a closure. So the function that the monad maker makes, remember this function is a function from a state to a state contents pair. So I should memorize something. State to state That's contents an instance, pair. Yeah, state to state contents pair is an instance of the state monad. So whew, this little guy up here is making an instance of the state monad. Okay. We're going to see this little pattern here over and over and over again so we don't have, we don't have to analyze it every single time. It's just a blob. It's a, it's a little cookie that comes out, you know. Give me an A and I'll make a cookie. Okay. It's an instance of the state mode. It's just a thing. But it's a thing that has closed over this, whatever the input to the state, whatever the input to the monad maker was, gets closed over, and now we see where the value, the, the instance of the monad, gets the value for the contents. So now there's a general principle. In pure mathematical programming, and we're talking about programming with pure mathematics, mm -hmm. not just for math applications, but for all applications, and in particular for programming itself. There's mathematics behind programming itself. There are only two kinds of variables. They're either bound variables or they're free variables. A bound variable is a function argument. A free variable has to be looked up somewhere else. Mm. It's in the ambient monad. Or it's in a closure which in a way is part of the ambient monad here in this little case. But it's not so ambient because we made it right here by calling this monad maker. Okay, this is all going to make sense in a second. <laughs> trust me, trust me, trust me. Now I'm going to take the little drawing that I was just riffing about and change it just ever so slightly. The way I'm going to change it is I'm going to make the monad maker on the right-hand side take in an A 
and be able to do any computation it wants with that A and turn it into something of type B. So the instance of the monad that, it, that the monad maker spits out, spits out is a function from a state to state contents pair, but the type of the content is different. So I can take a floating point number and change it into a string. I can change the type. Okay. I can do anything I want with it. This monad maker here can be, but now it's the B that's downstairs in the monad, instance of the monad that the monad maker makes is of different type. Well, if I wanted to glue these things together, Gluing means composition. Composition is good. Yes. Composition is how we build stuff up, how we build big things from little things. Mm -hmm. There's only one way to wire these up. Look at them. There's a monad instance of a monad on the left. There's an, a monad maker that creates an instance of a monad on the right. And if I want to wire them up, there's only one way. This A has got to go to that A. It's like wiring up by imp impedance or voltage. You got to match the the voltages. You got to match the types. It's only one way. There's no wiggle room here. But look what's happened. The result of the entire thing is something from a state to a state contents pair. There are no other outwires. I've taken an instance of the monad. I've taken a monad maker that makes an instance of the monad. I've glued them together in the only way possible and I've come up with an overall instance of the monad. Is that cool or what? Indeed. That's composition. So that's all I did on the board with Don't Fear the Monads, as I showed this. Except I didn't show it with the particular state monad, I showed it with any monad, which I wrote as M. This is how it works in the state monad. I'm going to show you why this threading the state through this way is the right way to do it. Look at this wire down on the bottom. That's threading that state through all those other little gadgets, just the way we were doing by hand with the mm -hmm. leaf part, right? Okay. All right. Uh, this was the non one added. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, yes. I want to talk about... Okay, yeah. Let's go back to that for one second here. Only one way to thread these guys together, and the type of the result is compatible with the type of the, of the inputs. So we've taken monad pieces and made another monad piece out of it. We haven't changed the kind to use the proper, proper lingo. So what is the critter that does that, that wires these two things together? It's got to take a different kind of arrow again here because I'm taking a function as an input. So here I take an instance of the state monad, that's a func from, func from state to, remember? State func to state plus content Contents, right. So I wrote that one in red. So that's this input over here is, is, is in red. And then it takes a monad maker as its second argument. That's the one I wrote in green. And then its output I wrote in blue. That's another instance of the monad. And I put a, like a thin little box behind it. So this guy here, this critter here in the center, is the guy that takes an instance of the monad, takes a monad maker, glues them together in the only way possible. It doesn't do very much. And results in a new instance of the monad. That's what this little arrow it makes a new function from function from state to, to content state pair. content pair, right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's good. No, that's, a, that's that. good. Yeah, I'll keep doing keep it. Doing that's that. all we have to remember is if it's an instance of the state monad if it's a function from state to state content pair. Okay, this little guy is the bind operator. That was the one that I wrote as arrow, arrow, shove in Don't Fear the Monads. It's also a clue to the link savvy, the signature of select many. Hmm. So select many is a guy, you could make an, a, a version of select many that does this gluing together and would have exactly the right signature. Okay. Okay? So link is under the, the, the fundamental math of, of uh, composition is built into link. And that's the, monads are nothing but the fundamental mathematics of composition in the presence of stuff. Now, now that you mentioned that though, the cool thing about link is that the way that developers use it is it's it's very expressive um, and not so in other words what basically what you're asking for in, in some sense is that ma that programmers become more like mathematicians I am that's my life and then you think I understand that but what we it's it's an interesting paradox because if you look at C sharp for example that there's really not that sort of meme anywhere in the, in, the, in the expressiveness of the language. So what I mean is, we're teaching developers to be much more 
uh, well, object-oriented, first of all, sure. but also to think more in terms of patterns um, and not necessarily the, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I was a math major in, in college, so, right. you know, the thing that math is hard is I never really got that. But the, the one thing that, that I think if you think about a general purpose programmer, whether they realize it or not, math is happening under the covers where it should be happening, Sure, in my opinion. I agree. But they can actually, up in the world where they have to compose their masterpiece and their artistry, need not necessarily be as low level. I think of, of mathematical programming as like low level programming, right? So um, how does this all work with the visual type developers, right? The C sharp uh, developers, the VB developers. Sure, sure. The, the message that I, well, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned visual because uh, the, the secret project that I'm working on includes all kinds of secret. <laughs> 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 That's good. That's but uh, as you can imagine, I'll be applying these, these uh, highfalutin mathematical ideas to visualizing things, in particular Excellent. visualizing programs and visualizing data and visualizing who knows what. Mm -hmm. C sharp, as of C sharp 3.0, and mm -hmm. I, I don't remember exactly when Lambda Expressions and, uh, and, 3 uh, was, and Link was put in, but as of, as of that version... Pretty sure. Yeah. yeah it, generics was 2.0. Generics was 2.0, but there were also, um, I think, anonymous, anonymous delegates were also available in 2.0, which means you could do, you could simulate some aspects of Lambda Expression. But okay. anyway, C Sharp 3.0, C Sharp today has all the stuff that you need to do very high level mathematical programming. But let me, let me address the idea that mathematical programming is low level. Um, Traditionally, we tend to think of it that way because mathematical programs want to exploit the machine hardware in the best way possible. So you do all kinds of bit hacking and uh, uh, you know, deconstructing the exact uh, bit patterns in floating point numbers to squeeze one more cycle here and there. But mathematics is completely general. Mathematics isn't just about bashing numbers together. Mathematics is about sets and about functions and about abstractions at all. Mathematics is the art of abstraction mm. and it's the art of precision. Now, th the abstraction part we got covered with all the other programming paradigms, the Fortran paradigm, you know, and, but from day one where you could create a block of code and label it, you had abstraction because then you could just go to that label and that was a little block of code that you could reuse over and over again. Mm -hmm. Functions were another uh, procedures, let me use the word procedures so that I can reserve the word function for pure mathematical functions. Procedures were another level of abstraction. Objects are another level of abstraction. We have all kinds of abstraction tools. Precision though is where mathematics comes roaring back into programming at all levels. Mathematics is the art of abstraction and the art of precision. We already got the art of abstraction covered with all the tools that are on the table. The art of precision, though, we don't have completely covered. And that's because the ordinary program, the ordinary non-mathematical styles of programming allow you to do things under the covers. So certain things are not, not always as precise as they could be. If you use the theory of sets and the theory of functions and the theory of relations to be absolutely rigorous about the programs that you're writing, you're forced into something like this. You're forced into something uh, like monads. and mm -hmm. You're forced to be precise about composing things. Forced to be precise about the types of things. The current crop of programming languages are very good about types, but they're not as absolutely as precise as they could be. So, for example, they can't tell the difference between a function... Uh, they can't tell the difference between a pure mathematical function and a function that may have updates in the ambient monad. They both have the same type, function from float to float, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think Haskell is the only language on the planet, living today, the only living language on the planet that can, that can tell the difference between uh, a, a function with side effects and a function without side effects. But I'm not, I'm not absolutely positive about that. It's certainly the, the easiest one to find and easiest one to use. There's another advantage, though, to being precise. C Sharp lets you be precise, but the programmer has to do the last little bit of detail, which means the programmer has to be rigorous about not indulging in side effects. And then you can write, I've got a program here that I hope is as 
I like the indulging in side effects. But yeah. Let's talk about that again really briefly. Yeah, I don't want to use negative or pejorative terminology. No, it's fine. You're right, though. In, yeah. in your world, and definitely in Haskell's world, side effects are, you know, sort of frowned upon, even though they they tend to be useful because that's how things happen. Yeah, that's the. those are <laughs> updates in the ambient monad. In fact, there's nothing wrong about side effects at all. It's just how disciplined, how precise are you going to be in your use of side effects. If your programming language allows you to update any variable, then you can never tell by looking at a variable whether it has been side affected. All Haskell does is discipline the side effects so that if you're doing side effects you have to do them in an explicitly written monad. Okay. So now you can tell. The stuff that's in the monad may have been side affected by whatever function was ahead of you and may be side, side affected by whatever function is behind you. Since you can't time the calling, you can't sequence things, well you can, but you're not supposed to. You can't sequence things other than by expressing them as dependencies, then it's all crystal clear. It's, it's, it's precise in the text of the program. In a, in a, uh, an, in a programming environment like C Sharp or F Sharp or VB, you're in an ambient monad, so everything is updatable. The, the, the downside of it is that when programs get very, very large, they, you tend to have to build an abstraction system inside the application itself to control the propagation of side effects. So you end up building a miniature monadic binding system anyway. You end up building something that sequences compu computations, that controls uh, access to variables. You end up building it anyway if the application gets big enough. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that Haskell is a panacea, by no means. Uh, one of the difficulties with Haskell programming is you write some program, you've got a bug in it, and you can't just throw a printf in there to see what's happening, because a printf has a side effect. You now have to go rip your whole program apart and put it back together in the I.O. monad, so that some function down there you, you can call printf in it and see what the result is. Mm -hmm. now, um, uh, you know, there are debuggers and other kinds of ways of dealing with it, but it's not a panacea at all. All it is is a more precise way of dealing with side effects. Since the language doesn't let you have implicit side effects, it forces you to make them explicit. And now we're since the language doesn't let you have implicit side effects, it forces you to make them explicit. And now we're back to talking about mathematics because this requires the programmer to think more precisely about programs. That's all. That's, well, they, that's they should it. be doing that anyway. I think so. It, and it's not a question of saying, oh, well, you programmers, you, have to, you better be mathematicians, otherwise you're, you're not being, uh, you know, hygienic or whatever. Mm. You know, you smell bad or something. I don't want to be pejorative about it at all. It's an invitation. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation to think more precisely about programs. And the benefits are that you will be able to have an, e you'll have an easier time in distributed concurrent world. Yeah, you'll have an easier time of having your application scale to a million cores. It might do, yeah. So, I mean, this is something, again, that's been a really big theme on Channel 9, in micro, you know, on my, at Microsoft, all over the you know, industry. Yeah. We've had this conversation over and over and over again uh, around, okay, a, a lot of people are making a huge deal of it. Some people don't think it's as big as it is. But, in fact, we what we have is an army of sequential programmers. Yes. We have an army of... Of pretty much typed sequential programmers, right? Using our suite of tools, which are very powerful, very powerful. But they also need to evolve. So this is a really interesting question. Yeah. And I've posed this to Anders and others. You know, since so much of what, let's be honest, C sharp is just a, a very teeny little wrapper on a giant machine of functionality. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the machine being able to deal with with uh. monadic composition, monadic yes. structures, the programmer herself or himself may not, you know, may not even need to think explicitly in terms of, of monads. No, 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 no. The machine takes care of that. Problem. Yes, yes. But they have to have some way to express that, okay, I want this to follow the rule of the state monad, right? S state to state content pair. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, this is great from a theoretical approach and, and, and Niners love this stuff and they, and they especially students who are yes, learning. Yes. Um, but I want to talk about the real world developers out there that yes. you know, they come into work from, you know, 11 to 2 in the morning. 
Yeah. And they have code to write. They have applications they need to get done. They, yes. they, they rely on tools. They're yes. comfortable with a specific language. Yes. In most cases, it's type sequential. Right. Let's talk about their world and what you're thinking, how that's going to relate to their world. Well, I think that, that as things stand today, the, the um, programming languages are not going to help you be more, more monadic. You'll see if you dig into the, the, the uh, demonstration that I did with Haskell and the equivalent C-sharp program, the C-sharp the program is much, much larger. And it's written in a kind of a strange, twisted style <laughs> that would not be that would not be um, would not be cuddly for an object-oriented programmer. But there are multiple uh, efforts um, uh, alive at Microsoft now for improving that situation. Mm -hmm. There's the uh, High Performance Computing Initiative. There's work that uh, Joe Duffy is doing with uh, uh, it started life as P-Link. I've not been keeping uh, keeping yes. track of it, but they're doing great work for unmet yes. for native and for bo for both kind of code. Yes. And so I think for the practical real world programmer uh, on the street who's l who's living day to day with our stuff, that's the stuff to watch, okay. because what they're going to do is introduce uh, uh, introduce these kinds of tools incrementally into C sharp, F sharp, and VB, and with with doing as little damage as possible to the existing object-oriented programming paradigm. They'll be adding some keywords, you know, here's, you add a keyword that says something is immutable, add some more keywords that say this, this little thing is thread safe or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, you know, as I say, I've not been track, uh, keeping track of the details, but at the principles I understand uh, uh, what they're doing. Um, so that, that's where I would want. What I'm trying to do is show you the asymptote, the heavenly, uh, you know, sort of uh, absolute pure uh, mathematics of what's going on behind it. So the, the, these incremental improvements to the existing systems get us closer and closer and closer to this kind of, of level of abstract purity. If you have this, this is the way I work anyway. Sure. I normally put a concept in my mind and then I look at something in the real world that's an approximation of that concept and I say, okay, here are the ways in which it fits this abstract concept and here are the ways in which it uh, doesn't fit. And then I control the complexity in my own mind by dividing it into two camps of things that uh, that work with the abstraction, things that don't. Uh, immutable data structures, you know, we have immutable data structures, but sometimes they're not really immutable. And so if, as long as you know where they're being mutated, then you can think of them as immutable everywhere else and then that gives you, that gives you the ability to, the, you know, the the advantage of the pure mathematical function is that it's referentially transparent. Every time you call it, you can count on it. It's a contract. Call sign of 1.1, it'll never ever change. Mm. If you actually implemented it as a table lookup, though, somebody could go in and sneak a new value in there and mutate your table and you'd, you'd surprise. Mm -hmm. But if it's pure mathematical, then you just kind of know where things are staying still and where things are moving. So that's what I would do. I would keep uh, I would keep a firm eye on the uh, the uh, parallel computing, parallel computing platform. Plat par that's right. I was hunting for the word. The PCP work. Yeah. Those guys have this as their mission, and they know exactly. They know all this stuff that I'm talking about here, and then they know exactly what they're doing, and it's going to be great stuff. Well, in fact, asynchronous agents in, in the concurrency runtime that they build on top of the concurrency runtime for native code is all about message passing and pipeline right. architectures. That's right. And message passing is just this way of threading the state through these through these little mathematical functions. Okay. So all I'm showing is a demonstration of the, the absolute pure, you know, limit point of uh, where you would go. The Eric Meyer sort of well, vision yeah, it, of, of it, pure functional. It's pure functional and if you were, I wouldn't recommend that anybody goes go off and, and implement big systems in Haskell, although it's getting closer to that. Mm -hmm. I've never seen growth in a programming language like I've seen growth in Haskell mm -hmm. in the last five years. Five years ago, Haskell was a small sort of university flavored effort with a few dozen libraries. I looked at the website the other day and there are hundreds of libraries on the Haskell website and people putting it through some serious paces. So, uh, you know. Now, you know, remember a couple of years ago now when you worked with Eric, um, you made a comment, and I can't remember, I think it might have been our first video we did with you when you talked about Time Warp. Yeah. Um, you, at that point, were actually doing work for the VB team, and you said yes. that your goal was to make 
uh, something along the lines of VB, the most uh, powerful language in the world. Yes. Uh, the ability to do incredibly complex things in a very in a very simple and elegant way. Yes. What are your thoughts on that thinking today? Well, the, VB, the, the, the landscape of, of programming languages has changed a little bit in the time since we talked about that video. Uh, the things that were attractive about VB then are still attractive to me now. And uh, so far as I know, VB is still a first-class citizen along with C-sharp and F-sharp. Absolutely. So there we go. Uh, I think those three languages are converging in their capabilities. At the time, VB was the only guy who had um, late binding. And so late binding enabled me to do certain kinds of things that I couldn't do with, uh, with pure static binding. Mm -hmm. Not without reflection, anyway, or something along those lines. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure if EB is still the only guy that has No, C-sharp 4.0, in yeah. fact, now it has announced? a static dynamic type. It's announced? Yes. Oh, good, OK. So so, <laughs> exactly, announced it exactly. to so these things are converging. Yeah. Lambda expressions are now everywhere. Mm -hmm. They, uh, uh, at the time we made that video, I think I had a, a PDC version of VB that mm -hmm. that had uh, uh, lambda expressions in it, and that was the only thing on the on the planet. But you know, these things are are, con are there. Those three languages now are becoming equally powerful in my view, and so now it's kind of dealer's choice. Which which one do you want to use? It's be more like the syntax that you like the best, or the um, uh, other advantages. Uh, I think uh, F sharp has more aggressive uh, type inference than either C sharp or VB, which enables you to write shorter programs. Mm -hmm. Type inference does. So that's a that's a choice for people who want to program that way. So uh, let's. Uh, I still love them all. So you're a scientist, and you know I love you know you actually you were an astrophysicist, so I yes. love the screensaver. Uh, oh yeah, this is the this is the the Orion uh, the Orion Nebula. So as I there's the Orion on that. Nebula, this is the Orion um, uh, constellation. So when you know when people actually watch this video, uh, you know we will have already released a really cool uh, interview that I was lucky enough to do down at JPL Ooh. with the people who built uh, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. Okay. And one of the questions I asked this, this one of the scientists, he's uh, sort of an executive, but he's also a scientist, robotist. Do you remember his name? Uh, Jeffrey um, Avery or something. No, I don't know him. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't. A lot, of, a lot of my old buds are still there. So. I'm sure you, you probably know him, and I probably got his name wrong. But yeah, no, uh, no. So it turns out that the code running on Spirit and Opportunity was written in C. Yes. And for them, that's like a big step up from oh, yeah. assembler. Yes. So what I'd ask, one of the things, you know, we always talk about concurrency, we keep pounding on concurrency. Let's set that aside for now and talk about reliability. Yes. You know, the code on opportunity can't crash very no. often. Um, though it does, they've done some brilliant work with how it reboots and yeah. they can actually, from Earth, pause a reboot sequence and then splice in fixed code yeah. that the reboot will then expect to be there yes. and it will actually continue to work. Very nice. It's, I mean, obviously done brilliant work, but they had yeah. to do it in C, man. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, what are we doing? What are you doing? What are your thoughts on building, Microsoft building really good software tools for science and for people that are sending things 100 million miles away from Earth? Yeah. Well, as as you, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a tough one. The uh, uh, space pre spacecraft programming is a whole world into its itself, and as you noted, that just just even moving to C from I get I don't know what assembler they were using, maybe sixteen fifty A. I mean, you know, <laughs> these hardened uh, rad hardened uh, processors that they have to send up, because you know one cosmic ray can ruin your whole day on uh, on a spacecraft. I'm sure. That, you know, <laughs> one cosmic ray a day. I love yeah, that. you know can, but. Um, I do think in the very long run that the mathematical style of programming, since it, in, since it is all about reasoning precisely about your programs, it cannot fail but to bring more reliability to software. Mm -hmm. It has to. Practically speaking, in the short term, no, I don't think so. I think what JPL is doing is probably the bleeding edge of the state of the art. Mm -hmm which they've lifted themselves up one very thin level above assembly language. C is not that far from assembly language. C is, C is a is syntactic sugar on the PDP-10 uh, instructions or PDP-11 instructions. Mm -hmm. um, 
all of these kind of things where you may have to splice in bits of code and, and control the boots, that's all the continuation monad again. Coroutines and bounded coroutines, and so mm -hmm. the, the fundamental mathematics of that is encoded in the continuation monad. And you're, you're already setting me up for my next uh, <laughs> channel line where I Excellent. show off the continuation monad. Oh, it's probably what you're doing. Uh, there, there's some work here on the uh, 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 on link to events. I don't know if you've talked to any of those guys. That's uh, that's not yet. I that's think in that's, Eric's group. Is that planned? Yeah. That's that's planned. Mm, mm, that would be a beautiful thing if, if yeah. that if that ever comes. If on. that ever happens. Yeah. This moment is a pipe dream. Uh, yeah, but um, so I think that link and the functional style for the very long run, 10, 20 years out, those are going to be the ways to build in reliability. But for today, I would talk to the operating system guys and see what they have. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm uh, Phoenix, and uh, mm -hmm. um, the, the, those, that's the compiler back end guys. Mm -hmm. and, well, I uh, mean, in the end, I mean, an operating system is just something that abstracts hardware. So yes. you want to, but they use Wind River. Yeah. As their base OS. Yes. Yes. Um, and I was curious about, you know, obviously it makes. Don't get me wrong. JPL is full of unusually bright people. Yeah. And so what they've done is probably unusually creative and, and excellent. Yes. So uh, what I'm saying is imagine being able not to talk about productivity and get to market quicker to be able to have software composition tools for yes. space exploration. Yes. Yes. There's a, there's a little effort uh, called House which is the Haskell operating users mumble mumble mumble. Yeah. Mark Jones if you if you uh, go do a search for Mark Jones and House and the Haskell operating, they're trying to write a little miniature operating system in purely compositional style in Haskell. Nice. And it's very small. Okay. That's the cool thing. What JPL wants out of these things is small, because the memories on these rad hardened uh, uh, spacecraft processors are small. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're not physically small. They're physically large because they need to be robust. The uh, environment in space is horrible. There are cosmic rays. I mean, I'm not joking mm -hmm. about cosmic rays come in and change cell memory. So they have EDAC, all kinds of crazy EDAC. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, all of the uh, the uh, work in uh, binary coding theory and a lot of beautiful mathematics there, algebraic coding theory, that all came out of JPL and doing EDAC, mm -hmm. uh, error detection and correction on memory and on signals coming back from spacecraft. Um, so that. Advances in pure mathematics Excellent. arose from just dealing with the problem of memory getting zapped by cosmic rays. And uh, so, listen, yeah, you know, this is important because yeah. I mean, look, there are monads on Mars. There are monads on Mars. There are monads on Mars today, as yeah. we speak. Excellent. And two rovers. Yeah. They, and they know about monads, and they're putting monads in their system. <laughs> we win. Right <laughs> go, monads go, monad team. <laughs> Go, go, Monad team. That's excellent. So, you know, let's, uh, as we Should wind, we finish off the tree? Let's finish off the tree, but let's also, you know, make sure that it's clear that everyone, you know, understands what they're looking at again. Yeah. I think we all have memorized what you asked us to memorize. State right? to state content pair. Yes. Now, and you remember how I threaded the state around in the non monadic tree labeler? Mm -hmm. Here's the monadic tree labeler. Here's the non monadic one again. Let me flip forward to page four. Okay, here we go. Here is an instance of the state monad. It takes in a state and it produces a state and contents pair. In this case, the state and contents are of the same type, S. Okay. This is a function that takes in a state and produces a state content pair, and all it does is bump the state. Remember how we bumped the state when we were labeling the leaf on a tree? Here is a monad maker that takes in some contents and produces a function from state to state contents pair. And all this does is thread A into the output of the monad that is produced. This is a notation, a graphical notation for creating a closure. This arrow that pierces the box here and pierces the box there without an arrow head is actually producing a closure. So this guy down below, the new little monad that the monad maker, the monad maker's name return, the monad the instance of the monad that it produces is a state to state contents pair. It closes over variable A. Okay, make monad on a leaf of X. Remember, we have just two cases to cover leaf and branch. So here's make monad of branch. I couldn't fit them on one page. Make monad of leaf of X takes in a, a tree that happens to be just a leaf, strips off the um, strips off the leaf constructor, sends the value down in here, and 
this makes a monad. Monad is a state to state contents pair. And this monad internally is built up by binding a pair of, of uh, monads. More carefully, an instance of the update state monad that I talked about, and a function, a monad maker, a function of n that returns the leaf. So it sends one n up here into a pair, and you can read all of this stuff. That calls return and produces this thing out the back. So remember how I wired the monad uh, things together. There's only one way to wire them together by this bind operator, which is select many. That's exactly what I'm doing here. That's what the pink lines are doing. That's a bind through select many or the bind operator that sticks things together. There's only one way to do it. Excellent. And now if we go look at the way it branches in a tree, it's a little cleaner in some ways because things can flow more linearly and I don't have, the update state monad does not appear here. Hmm. It only appears in the leaf in the leaf case, where I have to update the state. The only thing that appears here in a branch is a recursive call to make monad right, and make monad. I don't have to fill in all this stuff. It this is a monad maker, produces a function from state to state monad pair, and I just glue things together in the only way they can be glued together. There's no wiggle room. Hmm. Um, the result of the left gets sent into the result of the left gets sent over here to a new call of branch. The result of the right gets the contents part of the result of the right gets sent over to branch. The state keeps getting threaded through on the bottom, and out you go through return. And the result has of types. Uh, uh, the result of make monad is of type something that takes in a a non-labeled tree and produces a labeled tree in a state because it hooks together the monads internally. The state doesn't. So this is the win that you get over the non-monadic part. You okay. don't have to feed in the state at the top level. It's threaded through automatically. It's just hanging there. These functions don't do anything until you actually call them. So the result of this entire computation is a function from state to state content pair. Where we heard that before. It's an instance of the monad. When I call it, I feed in zero, I get back out the answer. So here's where I call it down here in the, in the Haskell version. Um, M label right here. There's the zero. Uh, that's how that prime, everything else is just priming the pump. That starts the pump going and uh, it chains through all these little functions and spits out the result. So I, uh, just to finish off the example here, what I did was at the end of the C-sharp version of this, I left some exercises. Great. The exercise, not ten exercises. Wow, this is awesome. One, generalize over the type of the state from int to any type s, so the state monad type can handle any kind of state object. Exercise two, go from lab uh, labeling a tree to doing a constrained container computation, as in uh, Windows Presentation Foundation. Mm -hmm. That's stacking things inside uh, stack panels or something like that, right? Okay. That's just state threading. Should be able to generalize that. Exercise three, promote the return and bind into an abstract class, M. So I just wrote them out in, uh, in straight up. You know, but it'd be nice to make the monad an abstract class. In Haskell it's called a, a type class. Excellent. So you say that labeled tree is an instance of the state monad. So exercise three is do that in C-sharp. Exercise four, which is hard, is go from a binary tree to an n-ary tree. That's hard. Exercise five, abstract from n-ary tree to IE enumerable and do the whole thing in link. Nice. Just throw away everything I did and do it with link and select many. Uh, exercise six, look up monadic parser combinators. Just do a search and you'll find Eric Meyer there, <laughs> uh, of course. And implement an elegant parser library using link. Link over parsers. Nice. You can make just with this just this one idea, mm -hmm. you can make link over parsers and build a parser library so that you can build up arbitrary, make your own compiler compiler. Awesome. I wonder if Bart DeSmet will be the first one to do that. I don't know. Exercise seven. Verify the monad laws, either abstractly or mechanically, for this state monad that the monad laws are they're associative 
and return on the left and return on the right are units. Okay. Uh, and uh, exercise eight, uh, design an interface for the operator's return and bind and rewrite the state monad so that it implements the interface. That's an alternative to the abstract class idea. Um, but in the light of what I was saying about the monad laws, it might be easier to do associativity and and uh, the unit laws in an interface than in an abstract class. Nine, look up the list monad and implement that so it implements the same interface, monad interface. And then exercise 10, um, deconstruct this entire example by using destructive updates in objects. In other words, rewrite this whole thing in object-oriented style with assignment and uh, do it in a disciplined way that treats the entire CLR and heap memory as a state monad. Amazing. So treat the CLR as the state monad and thread it through. Now you could deal with multiple CLRs by compositionally binding these instances of the state monad. If the entire CLR and heap memory is an instance of the state monad, then you ought to be able to compose together multiple CLRs by the monadic bind operator. Hmm. So that's that's a semester project. <laughs> Maybe well, a year. Well, this is great. Now, what? Uh, how should we go about? You know, this people can just do this on their own. I'd like to have some of these answers come back from the community onto Channel Nine. That's what I would and like. You to have to take a look at them. Yes, but you don't, may not have time to be like the professor here and go no. through everybody's answers. No. But if we provide a way for them to, to ship up, they should probably just use the sandbox, which well, we already have on Channel 9. So right. far, everything I've seen uh, on Channel 9, there are so many brilliant people out there. Yeah. And somebody is going to take this like a piece of raw, raw meat thrown yeah. to, the, to, to the tigers, right? And it's going to go completely nuts and do much more than I'd be able to do with it. So Cool. So these are just my little challenges to the community at large. But that's such, a, such an amazing group of uh, people you've got. Uh, watching Channel Nine is uh, it's neat, absolutely, it's really and it's lucky. I have to say it's a privilege mm. to be able to talk to them, and I appreciate it. Cool. Well, hey, thank you for coming on C Nine. All right, and we'll be back. Good. I mean, probably God knows when. I mean, you're a busy guy. Uh, well, you're challenged. You've, you've you've helped me challenge myself with the continuation continuation monad, monad and more on Mars. That one hurts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Take Very care. good. Thanks, Charles.